Hey folks, my name is Nick, this is Board Game Brawl, and it is time for the penultimate segment of my 2015 edition of my Top 100 Games. These are the 100 games I love the most right now at this point in time. We are only one segment away from my Top 10. We're going through 20 through 11 today, and I'm very excited. These are like the best of the best games, the games that I love and would recommend to anyone who like these types of games. There's always that little caveat there, but these are the games I would definitely grab if I was running out of my apartment because there was a fire or because finally my beagles had had enough and uh, staged a violent and bloody coup. Just, ah, uh, so many bodies. But if any of those situations or several other scenarios that I've thought about in my darkest nightmares uh, actually came to pass, these are the games I would try to save. Of course, there are people who disagree with me, and we give them a very, very tiny sliver of a platform to air those grievances in the form of second opinions on each of these entries. Let's get to it. My number 20 is down eight spots from number 12 last year, which really isn't a big drop, although since it's so close to the top, you might consider it to be a big drop. But that is Sentinels of the Multiverse from Greater Than Games, or should I say Dice Hate Me Greater Than Games. That is a big um, thing that happened in the past year, those two companies combining. So Sentinels of the Multiverse, I'm going to say, is one of the best superhero games because it's not a deck-building game like so many other uh, superhero deck builders, uh, superhero card games are, but... It does a very, very good job of making you feel like you're doing something really cool and significant than the other players. It doesn't feel necessarily like you have a superpower, but it feels like whatever your ability is, no one else on the team can do it. Whatever you specialize in. Whether it is um, the Wraith doing all kinds of different projectile attacks and responses and counterattacks, or whether it's Legacy absorbing all types of different hits and just having like high hit points, or uh, any other number of characters. Healing characters, there's characters who uh, do all kinds of like weird tricks and things like that. It definitely just gives us, or, or the what's what's the uh, the Iron Man type character Bunker, who has different modes of uh, of uh, attack, offense, and defense. All these different things make you feel like a distinct superhero, and I love that feeling. And there's so much variety too: variety of characters to play as, of, of heroes to play, uh, villains to play, fight against. Then you have environments, so there's a ton of variety, a ton of different um, setup and scenarios. No two games feel alike. And yes, the game is not perfect. There's a lot of bookkeeping involved where you have to move tokens around constantly. And I have uh, infamously gone on record as saying that I think the artwork is some of the worst amongst games that I love. Definitely I've seen worse artwork, but amongst the games that I really appreciate, given that I love artwork so much and that I really have an, uh, not, not that I have an eye for it, but according to my own taste, but um, that I put so much uh, stock in it and that it, it influences how much I appreciate a game that much, that really counts against it, That how bad the artwork is for Sentinels. But nevertheless, even despite that, I still love the game. I still think it's fantastic, and I gobble up every expansion, whether it's a small expansion or big expansion, as it comes out. That is Sentinels of the Multiverse from Greater Than Games, Dice Hate Me Games, down eight spots to number uh, from number 12 to number 20. Uh, Tang 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 strongly disagrees and wrote a little saga here that I just have to read the entirety of. The more I played it, the more I hate it. Looking at the artwork they tried to trying to pass off as uh, comic style gave me a tumor. Disgusting and amateurish drawing that could only come from a toddler with a brush. Yuck. And there are so many tokens and updates to keep track with each new villain. Very, very clunky gameplay. Do I feel like a hero? Nah. More like accountants trying to balance the bo- accounts. Very tiring and boring. P.S. The drawings really suck. I'm, I'm putting a blanket statement out here right now. I am not correcting anyone's grammar or spelling anymore. My number 19 is brand new to the list, and it is Elysium with, from uh, Asmodee and Space Cowboys. Yeah, I think Space Cowboys did that game, uh, which is another uh, notch on Space Cowboys' belt as far as fantastic games. I remember the first time I played Elysium, and it was one of those games where midway through the game, I'm not even sure I was doing very well. I think I did pretty well, but I, I wasn't sure at that point. But I looked around at everyone at the table and was like, I'm, I'm loving this game. What do you guys think? And I so rarely do that. So many times, even for a game that I ultimately end up really enjoying that could end up on this list, I have to give it some time afterwards. I have to play it again and maybe even again, maybe even again. And I'm like, I just got to think about it a bit and see and, and feel out all the different aspects of it. Halfway through my first game of Elysium, I'm, I'm like, 
this is great. And we ended up playing it again right afterwards. That never happens in my group. I may play a game multiple times, but it's spread out over days and of, 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 or like a whole week of different game groups because I want to play it with different people or I just want to give a variety to our game sessions. I was like, we got to play this again. And that's how great it was. Elysium has, first off, it has beautiful artwork. It's about you trying to manipulate these different uh, Greek gods uh, and trying to get different... It's a set collection game. or different, getting different cards in families in order to get the most points. And each different type of god, you actually randomize a setup of god cards that you use in the game, whether it's Zeus or Apollo or uh, Athena or all these different uh, gods. They all have a different focus. Uh, Hades is all about um, getting more sacrifices. And uh, Zeus is all about victory points. And Athena does, I forget, some sort of weird thing with uh, certain cards, uh, kicking off other cards' abilities and things like that. And then Apollo has like this whole other or separate board, like the Oracle board. They do some funky things, and that's what I love is that, again, just like what I was saying about Sentinels, no two games feel exactly alike, at least, unless you play it like 20 million times. But it just feels very distinct. It feels like you're always... Uh, doing something different than the other players as you're focusing on different aspects and nevertheless it still can feel like a pretty cutthroat game because you're all drafting uh, from the same pool of cards and turn order is incredibly important and you're bidding for order in a sense it's such a great game i had it's, it's easy to, to teach uh for the most part i don't need, i maybe call it with mi- I, I might call it midweight it doesn't last too long it doesn't overstay its welcome and in for most in most cases uh but I feel involved and engaged the whole time. One of my favorite games of the new year, that is Elysium from Space Cowboys and Asmodee. Elocution Safari, despite his cool name, is definitely disagreeing with me here and says, Convoluted, abstracted, arbitrary Euro, a random collection of mechanisms barely held together by mediocre art and ugly iconography. My number 18 moved up 11 spots from number 29 last year and just completed a really, really successful Kickstarter for an expansion set. That is Arcadia Quest from Cool Mini or Not. This game, I kind of felt for a while that it wasn't getting much love. It came out, some reviewers like myself were really, really hyped on it and loving it, and of course, diehard Cool Mini or Not fans were all over it, but then it just kind of feel like, yeah, I guess that game's still out there somewhere. I still loved it, but no one was really talking about it. But the fact that Arcadia Quest Inferno came up on Kickstarter and just, like, made buku bucks, like 1.7 million, I think, was its final total or something like that, uh, and got everyone excited means that there's the audience has grown for it over time. It was dormant for a while, but now it's back. This game is essentially a, uh, uh, I think we call it like MOBA games, massive online battle arenas. Each player takes control of a guild of characters. There's three different characters that you can decide however you want to do it, but you can draft the characters in the beginning, whatever you want. And then you're all going out on this map that looks like a typical dungeon crawling map filled with monsters, but your goal is to meet certain quest objectives. You're not working together cooperatively. You're trying to kill the other players, because that's one of the possible quest objectives. Or you're trying to just kill monsters. You just kind of sit there and wait to be killed, but they might counterattack you. Uh, but they get to, they give you gold, and uh, you, there's other types of guild quest things you can do depending on the scenario. And that's the other thing. It's a campaign-driven game. But what I enjoy about it is that I've done some of the campaign stuff, and that and that's a lot of fun. But you can just bust it out and do whatever campaign mission you want and still have a lot of fun doing it. I mean, without even doing the whole string of uh, campaigns. And that's great. I love that uh, flexibility there. But if you do the campaign, it's a lot of fun, too, because you can level up and, and buy stuff in between. Things like that level up in a sense. So, and there's tons of characters. This game is a character-driven game. The same way I love character-driven movies and books and TV shows and things. This is a character-driven game because that is everything. It determines your whole play style. And there's so many different characters to choose from and great, unique characters. And, of course, I love the chibi art style as well. So, can't wait for the new set, Inferno. Although it'll be, uh, be quite a while. But even for right now, the base set, Arcadia Quest, is amazing. That is my number 18. Teppy came on 28, I think that is, says, rating is mostly due to the chibi artwork. Otherwise, it would be a four. My number 17 is down three from number 14. However, had I done my top 100 perhaps a little bit later in the year, or if a certain expansion for this game had come out to retail sooner, then this actually most likely would have moved up on my list or at least stayed the same. That is Comet. 
from Asmodee and Matagot, who does amazing, very highly produced games. And the reason I say all that is because the Comet's uh, Tav Seti expansion uh, was sort of given a small release at Essen just a couple of months ago, but hasn't really hit mainstream retail in North America yet. But I've heard it's amazing. I can't wait to check it out, and it's going to give me an excuse to finally do a full review of Comet, even though I love the game. I just never got around to it. I got it before I actually started the channel. Uh, but it's a fantastic, uh, very light war game. I don't even know. I hate to misuse the word war game, but it's an area control game for sure. You are taking control of uh, different forces and factions in ancient Egypt, but it's fantastical ancient Egypt with giant monsters and giant scarab beetles and uh, scorpions and uh, uh, sphinx and all these different types of things and magic spells. And it, there's a lot of really cool elements to the game. Each player has under its control several different pyramids or large D4s that you level up, and those enable the, uh, they give you access to better special ability tiles of the appropriate types. Like all the white tiles can be like defensive ones, and cards give you more magic power, whereas the blue ones are uh, more about the, uh, I can't really remember, like trickery and things like that. Or maybe I'm thinking of magic. Or, but the red tiles for sure are like all attack and getting really powerful creatures that are really good in combat. So I love that whole aspect. The, the combat in this game is fascinating too. It's sort of the Game of Thrones style of card combat where you have a set of cards, you choose which ones you want to play, simultaneously reveal, but then you don't get to get them back until you've used all of them or at least most of them, something like that. It's been a little bit while since I played it. But uh, then the, the combat is super fast and super visceral, and it doesn't penalize you too much. That's what I love. In these types of games, often, if you're utterly like you know wiped out by your opponents like early in the game, you're just kind of sitting around because there's no way you're coming back. I've seen massive comebacks in this game. I've seen a lot of close versions of this game because it's not too easy to just pick yourself up, brush yourself off, especially if while your forces are being destroyed, you're still slowly building up your pyramid strength. So I love the production values of this game. I love the theme. Theme. I love the fast and fun combat. It's been a hit with everyone I've played it with. That is Komet. I can't wait for the expansion. My number 17. On Myokomo, oh, Kokomo says, the Egyptian theme in Komet is so flimsy as to be almost non-existent. I feel the designers had no theme at all before one of them saw the pyramidal shape of the four-sided dice the game uses as counters and shouted, Eureka, Egypt! Komet's teleportation and monsters feels more like the movie Stargate than actual Egypt. I'm telling you right now, if they rethemed this into Stargate, I'd still love it. My number 16 is notable because I remember last year it just missed the cutoff point for my list. I had already started recording my list after, uh, right before I played this game and then played this game again, and then played this game again, and fell in love with it, and it was just too late to go onto my list without seriously messing up the balance of things. So it couldn't make it, but I think I just barely squeaked onto my top 10 of the year last year, maybe. That is Zaya from Far Off Games, yes, Far Off Games, whose only other game is a surfing game, which I'm not sure funded on Kickstarter or not, but Zaya is amazing, even if it's the only game this publisher ever makes again. This is essentially a sandbox game, but it's an intergalactic sandbox game. Each player takes control of a different ship that starts off very weak at the beginning of the game. But as you go through the game, you might get upgrades, and then you just decide what you want to do. Do you want to be a pirate and kill the other players? You can do that. Do you just want to pick up and deliver, trade goods, and get victory points that way? You can do that. Do you want to uh, be a police officer or a bounty hunter that hunts the players who are pirates? You can do that too. You just want to explore and go find different new tiles in different areas and do that. You can do that too. I love that. I love that every game of this I can try something different. And it feels so light that I don't really care if I do well or not. I have fun with the exploration aspects. The components are amazing from the money to the ships to the tiles. Uh, I love the, uh, the whole aspect of just... Uh, every player is getting a, the whole way you upgrade your ships. And so that, again, I keep going back to this point. Any game that makes you feel different and distinct from the other players, I love. It's one of the problems I have with Euro games so often is that everyone just feels like they're doing kind of the same thing, but they have different colored meeples. Uh, but in this one, you definitely can you get a... Uh, you, the way that you want to progress, the, what you choose to do during the course of the game just dictates like what types of ships you most you might be interested in. And they have different minis for all the ships. That's fantastic. There's so many good things about this game. Yes, it's very random. It's definitely an Ameritrash game. Yes, I know my computer screen just turned off and that was probably super distracting to you. But that doesn't matter. Zaya is awesome. So <laughs> that is Zaya. I wish it had... Uh, 
made it on uh, last year's list, so it wouldn't be new this year for sure. But nevertheless, I urge you to check it out if you can find a very expensive copy of it. Uh, Grusher, however, says, Rating based on reading a comment of a post of a video of a rough description of the rules. That's all I need to make an informed decision. My number 15 is one of three games that actually dropped out of the top 10 from last year. Uh, So not a huge drop, but still, I suppose you might put some weight in the fact that it dropped out of the top 10. And the first of these is Tonto Quarry, my number 15. It is down eight spots from number seven. Now, Tonto Quarry is a fantastic deck builder. For me, it really uh, didn't totally replace Dominion. I still have Dominion, and I still enjoy it. Dominion kind of had like a renaissance with me this year because of the newest set, Adventure. But nevertheless, I will always choose to play Tonto Quarry over it because not only do I like the artwork and the theme better, despite what some people say, uh, I also like the different expansion sets and what they add to the mix. Everyone adds something really new and unique to the mix. Like the Romantic Vacation has these new like types of achievement types cards are called Reminisce cards where you, you can manipulate your hand and discard certain cards in such a way as to gain these achievements, gain a lot of points and have a special effect. I love that idea. I love the um, Expanding the House, the second expansion, which are or the first expansion, which gives you these uh, different buildings you can buy. Oktoberfest has been perpetually delayed, uh, but I've heard that's pretty amazing as well from people who somehow got early copies of it despite the Kickstarter backers not getting it. Hmm. But <laughs> nevertheless, I still love the game. I think the only reason it dropped is just because there's been so many amazing games on the list this year. Um, and uh, there is perhaps one other deck builder that I like better, or maybe a couple, that I like better than this game. But it's still solid, deterministic deck building game with in my opinion, I know some people disagree, great theme and artwork. That is Tonto Quare from Japanime Games, originally Arc Light. However, Los Shabos Dragon, who has wonderful spelling and grammar, which means you know that it's not, says, the whole theme is distasteful. Okay, a lot of employers must have lusted for their employees, but to make a whole game with such an game where everything evolves about this... Only for Pansu Pedo Fetishists who might want to cover their fetish with a capital F. My number 14 is another game that fell out of the top 10 from uh, number 10 down to number 4. So it was just barely in the top 10 last year and it didn't really fall that far. And that is Robinson Crusoe Adventures on the Cursed Island from Ignacy Trevichek and his company Portal Games and now Z-Man Games. This game is a cooperative game that is in every sense of the word both a cooperative game meaning you have to work together at every angle and there's so much going on in the game that it's very difficult for someone to just alpha game the whole thing because at a certain point you are so overwhelmed that you're just like I don't care what you're doing just do something smart over there because I gotta worry about this over here because everything goes wrong. This is a game all about survival, and it definitely feels like that right from the very get-go, where in most first uh, rounds of the game, of this game, you're like, oh, well, some of us aren't eating tonight. <laughs> That's just how the game goes. It might be, we don't have a shelter for tonight. Now we're cold. Now our food gets destroyed. Now we're not eating. Or a tiger just attacked. Or a snake just popped out of the tiger's mouth and latched onto my face. And now I fell into a, a pit with more snakes. Okay, that's slightly exaggerating, but not by much. That's how dangerous this game is. Um, they might as well just put a live snake right in the box. I mean, it would be the same effect. Uh, so it's a very overwhelming game, but I'll tell you what. I love the challenge. I love the fact that because of all these disparate elements and the exploration aspect, I mean, this game can wear a lot of different hats. Exploration game, worker placement game, cooperative game, of course. Uh, storytelling game. Ignacy Trebuchek is famous for saying, I want to tell board games that tell, I want to make board games that tell stories. So that is this as well. Uh, I mean, it's so many different things you can call this game. I just call it fun. Okay, that was terrible, but it really is. It's an amazing, super difficult cooperative game. Um, Just such a great storytelling experience with fantastic bits and artwork. Really, really love this one, despite very, very, very rarely winning. (laughs) And despite the fact that I have uh, seriously delayed playing through the Voyage of the Beagle expansion, which really... Uh, is ironic. I really should have played something called The Voyage of the Beagle by now. But nevertheless, maybe if I do, this will go further up on the list next year. But that is Robinson Crusoe, Adventures of the Cursed Island, my number 14 this year. But John K. Friday says, it has a 40-page FAQ, which is more than most medical equipment. 
My number 13 is brand new to the list, uh, and it is very hot right now, very controversial right now, which means, of course, it has a, a home on my list if it's controversial. That is Time Stories from Asmodee, again from Space Cowboys. I'm telling you, Space Cowboys, a publisher to watch, or a studio to watch, whatever you want to call them now. Uh, but this is a fantastic, uh, t- talk about storytelling games, this game is all story. It's like a tiny RPG in a box, essentially. I talk about that a lot with games like Descent. This is one that manages to tell a story without like a, a ton of overbearing components and miniatures and lots and lots and lots of bits. There are discs and you know tokens and things like that. But for the most part, the footprint of this game is relatively small. And that's because what you're doing is going through essentially a choose-your-own-adventure that is all card-driven. These big storytelling, like Seven Wonder-sized cards, uh, storytelling cards... And you and the other players are time travelers who quantum leap back into receptacles of people who would not be missed by history. And you try to solve these temporal anomalies. And there are all these different stories. And um, I'll just say that the first one was Asylum, which meant you were going back to a mental asylum um, in the past. The second one, you were going back to the mid to early 90s and investigating um, some goings on in a, a town beset by some sort of incident. And I won't say more than that. And that's the thing, is that this game is very spoiler-heavy. And in fact, one of the things that people don't like about the game is that once you have played through an entire scenario and solved whatever the mystery happens to be, that's kind of it for you and your group and whoever else took part in the game. Because once you know what's going to happen, that's it. But there are going to be expansions coming out. And I'll tell you, despite the replayability issues, one play of this I would put up against 10 plays of well a lot of other games apparently because it's that amazing going through these different scenarios and the the monumental choices you have to make there's still a solid game here too with how the uh, combat works and how the uh, the action efficiency of going to different areas and working together fully cooperatively because you cannot do everything on your own you need to rely on your party members to go off to different locations and search and talk to people or things and interact with things in the environment in a smart way because you can't just freely share information i mean you can do a degree but for the most part you have to either team up and go to different areas or spread out and trust in your teammates so many cool thematic elements in this game i love it i really do i can't i've already played through both uh storylines that they have out right now i can't wait for the next one i really can't it's an amazing game and an amazing innovative experience i can't there's very few games maybe a couple more on my list that i would say are more innovative but that's definitely saying something nowadays that is time stories from space cowboys and asmodee but deke dagger says the phantom menace of board games so disappointing That's not a great quote, but I've been watching the Red Letter Media reviews of the prequels, and I just had to throw that in there. My number 12 is the last of the casualties to fall out of the top 10. This one actually fell, not that it was a ton of spots, but it fell all the way from number 4 down to uh, 8 spots down to number 12, and that is Small World. And any flavor of Small World that you can choose, whether it's a base game or underground, I love them all and own them all. It's a fantastic game. It only fell again because it's it's a lot of competition this year and other games that are uh, in the top 10 I just played more often as well. That's always uh, a thing that's just going to weigh on the decision. But that's still fantastic to be at number 12. And it's still a, a wonderful game. This is one of the games I would put into the category of, okay, we've played some really simple games with these new people. Let's upgrade them to the next step. And I think this is a next step type of game because it's still relatively simple, but there's a lot of uh, gameplay elements and mechanisms in Small World that can be uh, that you'll see in much more complicated area control games. And this is area control with fantastic bits. It's got the theme isn't like super strong in the game, but you do have all these different fantasy races, which are really cool. And they have abilities that are thematic to their uh, type of race, like either like uh, giants being stronger in the mountains or uh, these different like flame creatures and uh, the, just uh, the, the lava people. I mean, okay, I could go on and on and on. There's a ton of different ones. I'm struggling to remember specific ones. Um, the uh, the skeletons that multiply by creating more undead, so on and so forth. But uh, even with just the base game, there's so much replayability because you get these special powers and the races together and combine them. It has this awesome mechanism, which I actually talked about on uh, with the game Forens earlier in the list, where 
you have these all these different races and powers lined up and you can choose whichever one you want but you have to drop coins which are victory points on the races that you don't choose down going down the line and the other players get to take the other ones uh the ones that are earlier up and your victory point coins with them so i love that i love that whole aspect i love the aspect of turn uh, putting races in decline in the game so you've taken a race at the beginning it's gone as far as it can possibly go you've extended it as far as you can now it's time to put it into decline it starts to die out take another one but still hope that your in decline races can stay on the map as much as possible because you're still going to get points for them such a great game it really really is and i haven't played it in a while but even talking about it right now i want to play it again that's how good it is that is small world or small world underground my number 12 john banditini says exciting entertaining and fun are just three words i would never use when talking about small world boring turgid and dull come much much more to mind dreadful excuse for a game my number 11 is brand new to the list and you might be saying to yourself nick a brand new game made it to number 11 on your top 100 games list that is completely absurd and ridiculous to that i would say you're going to want to hold on to that outrage uh the my number 11 though is roll for the galaxy from rio grande games uh this one oh man I have done a review of the base game, and I've done a review of the expansion, which just came out a couple of months ago. So if you've been keeping up with the channel, you know how much I love this game. But I'll tell you, I don't even know that I put it into proper words in the uh, the reviews that I did. Because this is a, a, a huge benchmark, and I've said this before on several games on the list. A huge benchmark for me as to whether or not a game is amazing and whether it's worthy of a list like this, if any game really is, is that it's not enough that I love it. How much does everyone else in my group love it? There's a lot of games I'm in the list I totally am in love with that I find it really hard to get to the table or that I always have to try to convince people is good somehow or some way because I'm like one of the sole fans of it, at least in this area. But for this game, Roll for the Galaxy huge hit with everyone that's how universal it's been in fact it's been a huge hit with people who are former race for the galaxy fans which is a a iconic game at this point and i played it with people who are like but i love race for the galaxy there's no reason i'm going to play a dice version of it oh my god this game is amazing that's the reactions i get for roll for the galaxy and for me personally i never liked race for the galaxy and so i was actually skeptical of roll for the opposite reason like well i hated race if this is even a little bit like it how is this going to be good? Well, let me explain. <laughs> First off, the idea of rolling dice uh, is just more appealing to me than... I, I do love card games, don't get me wrong, obviously. But the idea of rolling the dice and having to ma- manipulate them and using them as resources has always been very appealing to me. I love that kind of stuff, um, especially with dice building games. And that's what this is as well. There's a little bit of dice building where you put out different worlds, which gets you different dice into your cup, and then you can use them uh, later on. But then you have this whole aspect of you're building these different planets, and it feels more momentous because not rather than in race where it's just like you're playing down cards with different special abilities, now you're actually building out your tableau of planets so you can see it grow in front of you. You've got developmental planets, which just give you different special abilities, or you've got these worlds where you can actually ship goods and create goods and produce them there and get you more, yourself more points that way, and those are also going to get you more dice representing your populace and uh the the whole mechanism of how you get dice back into your cup so many amazing things about this game the production values are great it feels a little bit more thematic it's easier to understand the iconography is not as crippling as it was in race for the galaxy and again everyone i played it with has loved it and it's getting a ton of love in the major board gaming community as a whole as well for very good reason not just a gimmick that is roll for the galaxy my number 11 in the final game on this segment of the list and so we end with mcdean's comment he says take the two games i hate and then mash them together the sum is worse than its parts now i know what one of those games is i don't know what the other one is king of tokyo in any case that is the end of the penultimate segment of my list the only thing that's left the top 10 games of the top 100 games for 2015 i think people are going to be maybe half not that surprised and half very surprised we'll see but i can't wait to do it then we're going to do a wrap-up episode where we go through different metrics and stats and different things like that can't wait super excited thank you so much for hanging in there take care we come